cool. It shows up. So this is uh, this talk's going to not be like super archival based, but it has a lot of concepts that uh, archivists need to deal with, like uh, the world's going file based. Uh, not all these files are going to be particularly nice. You want to archive these files, you got to deal with their crap. So who am I? Uh, I'm a senior video engineer at Vimeo and open source developer on FFmpeg, FMS2, a couple of other things. I sit on the Videoland nonprofit board, which means I get to go twice a year and talk about very boring financial stuff. And I am a professional Twitter troll. So, <laughs> so you have users. Um, not everybody has the ability to uh, you know, tell their users, we want this or we're not going to accept your thing. Uh, you can provide them guidelines, but they're just that. They're guidelines. Um, but they're still going to want you to, you know, uh, convey their artistic intent properly and not screw up, you know, their vision, what they want. Uh, so as a result, you need to ingest a very vast of wide array of media um, and you need to provide easy, good feedback to these users for how they can maybe improve their great files. So you're like a purist, look away now. We munge a lot of stuff. Uh, we'll go a little more into each of these and a few others. Uh, but hopefully, you can take away some kind of uh, uh, info on good ways to analyze various bits of the file and maybe how you can munge them. So. Before we can do anything, we need to pick a stream to use. This is not always obvious. You might get uh, you know, a file with 19 video tracks, all the exact same duration, all the exact same content, but one might be green. Uh, if, it, if you have a spec, if it's IMF, it's iTunes, great, you're done, no problem. Otherwise, it's heuristics. Uh, for video, it's kind of a, a basic thing. Uh, as dumb as it sounds, uh, we make a score based on how likely it is to be like a legitimate video stream and simply being JPEG like tanks that score immediately because it's almost always a thumbnail or like timed thumbnails or something like that and it's usually not tagged properly. Um, except when you do want those thumbnails to be the video stream like for slideshows. Um, then you rank beta based on total duration, bit rate, that kind of thing and pray you're right. Same for audio, uh, we wanna, if there's multiple audio tracks, uh, we wanna pick the official studio down mixed one so if there's a spec like iTunes again, great. Uh, but you do want to bias towards like, uh, if you want to produce a file, one that's you know, 5.1, one's at 2.0, and it carries both in the source, you want to use the studio version, don't do your own down mixing. Um, uh, this is kind of specific to FFmpeg, but you want to prefer streams with earlier start times, just a consequence of how its editless support works. And uh, as usual, Try to prefer longer durations, ones that match your video duration. Um, so indexing. It's first thing we do, we get a file, we index it. Um, we don't want to constantly open the file, have to you know, transfer 200 gigabyte file somewhere, open it over a network, that kind of thing. So do an index, shove it somewhere. It should be like 200 kilobytes. Index all the frame types, timestamps, that kind of thing. Uh, this is not decoding, so you're not going to get like block level reference stuff. You're not going to be able to easily support stuff with no keyframes, that kind of thing. This is mainly for ease of passing around uh, and a hell of a lot faster than a full decode. But this is essentially building like an, a packet to frame mapping, which is a little harder than it sounds because there's a lot of fun stuff like alt refs in VP9, null packets in MPEG4 ASP, path files, edit lists, order chapters, that kind of thing. We'll get more into that later. Uh, we do chunk transcoding. So you want to pick, you want to be able to know if I seek in this file, am I going to be able to decode or am I going to have to decode the whole file to get there? So you want to take something kind of like a weighted quantile uh, of all the keyframe distances between, or the distance between all keyframes weighted in the time domain. So that's kind of going to get you how likely am I going to be able to seek somewhere and ha within a certain amount of frames or time, get a keyframe. And uh, I already mentioned no block level analysis. And of course, you want to throw chunks based on where, where, where in the file keyframes are, 
the kind of correlates to shop and not necessarily because key, contrary to popular belief, keyframes are not scene changes. They are just where the encoder thinks it's good to put a keyframe. Um, so scaling, doesn't matter what you do, everyone's gonna hate you. Um, <laughs> you have to play on a lot of devices, but there's always gonna be the guy that says like, oh, why didn't you use eight taps or something like that? Um, but yeah, this, the goal here is wide compatibility. Um, everything's resized to be mod two, you know, standard one one sample SF ratio, rotation like hard applied. We're not pass we're not shipping that as meta data. Uh, resampling method is going to depend on whether we're downscaling or stretching, um, or if we're just feeling a little cheeky and we want to like get a little better compression for the you know like the one forty four p transcode we use by linear or something for that. Uh, some interesting encoders will pad uh, 422 or 420 files with like gray or zeros for green and uh, they won't flag this in any kind of cropping parameter so you of course have to check the last line of the video and say you know memcomp against zero or something and then crop it off and this has to be an edge case like everything else in this talk and some decoders will just in output impossible things you need to play along with that It'll They'll output like odd resolution 410, which makes no sense. You can't have some type of chroma that's you know, odd resolution. And of course, you need special cases. In this particular case, you need to know exactly how the decoder is going to output that and what it expects you're going to do if you're going to overread or underread. And fields, we de interlace, we apply inverse telecining. Correctly take files are kind of not the norm. So you gotta try and detect it. Uh, so, you know, this, the simple way is to, you know, take, take this line, take this line, the middle line, multiply the middle line by two, compare it to the, the sum of the other two lines. Uh, you do that for the whole frame and then you do that temporally as well. Doing it temporally gets you whether it's, uh, you know, top field first, bottom field first, or if it's progressive. Um, for uh, telescene content, a uh, common misconception is that you get a nice 3-2 pull-down for the whole stream. Usually it changes at uh, wherever the encoder decided to put a keyframe. Uh, so take that into consideration. And I don't know why Blu-ray didn't allow 50p, but it didn't, as far as I know. So, or was it 25p? Either way, you have kind of this fake 50i content. Um, and you don't want to deinterlace that. So have a special case for that as well. Color spaces. <laughs> yes. Everything. Unless it's HDR, it's either going to want to play BT709 or BT470 or SMPTE 170M, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you can try and convert these based on tags. It's not obvious which tags to use necessarily because the bitstream may have tags, but the container may also have tags. And the best you can do here is uh, do it on a container and bitstream by bitstream basis. So like, you know, if it's H64 in MP4, then you'll probably want to prefer this, that kind of thing. Um, your converges need to be gamma correct. A lot of, st like SW scale doesn't do this. Uh, you should use the image instead. There'll be a link at the end of the slides. Um, last resort, you can kind of guess based on frame rate and Resolution, you really shouldn't be doing this, but sometimes you have no choice. Uh, HDR. Uh, so obviously you need to produce SDR. You want to dither it. Uh, I strongly advise against using an order, order dither or Bayer-Steinberg dither. I find a uh, random dither is the least jarring. Um, and we, we ingest all sorts of HDR content, but again, we want to be broadly compatible, so we've settled on HDR10. We would have preferred HLG because it's a little more backwards compatible, but like Apple exists and Dolby exists and corporate shenanigans ensue. ensue. Uh, we, for the SDR version, we use an in-house tone mapping based on the Mobius transform-based algorithm from LibPlacebo. There'll also be a link at the end of the slides for that. And I mentioned this one already, you need to choose between tenor and bitstream, and some stuff ships ICC profiles with it. Uh, so MJPEG ships 
can ship ICC profiles per frame, which is great fun. We use, uh, I think it's tiny CMS or small CMS to apply this. And uh, in theory, MP4s can ship a color box that contains an ICC profile. I've never seen one. Nobody on Twitter could give me one. I managed to discuss Charles Poynton, and it was great. <laughs> I think that's one of my favorite Twitter conversations ever. Uh, Timestamps, the big one. I'm not going to enumerate everything can be wrong with that. Uh, you can see my talk from last year at Demuxed. I think some of you have. Uh, so the very first thing you want to do is, like, does this file have a concept of a frame or a field rate? And if we can use it, great. But make sure you can, because say some AVI files have, sure, AVI files have a concept of a frame rate, but if you have null packets, then it's useless. Uh, another big uh, no-no here in the archival world, we, we normalize everything to be constant frame rate. Um, <laughs> this started back in the day because Flash didn't play super well with that. It's kind of lived on since then. We might revisit it. Uh, but in general, the little plastic devices don't like variable frame rate content. And QuickTime has some really weird bugs related to the precision of frame rates. We have to like make sure everything fits in like a, I think it's 16-bit integer per, for the numerator and denominator. Uh, and our indexing from earlier helps here. You can analyze the PTS, DTS, and frame durations and fud, fudge a good frame rate out of it. Uh, you want to take into account positive and negative time step discontinuities. So, Great, it's easy if you have like timestamp 1 million goes back to zero. Easy, it's discontinuity. You can adjust for that. You can adjust the timestamps after that. It's less obvious for a positive timestamp discontinuity because you have to say, if I have frame 1 million, or sorry, PTS 1 million, and the next one's PTS 2 million, is that like a discontinuity? Should we adjust? Or is it just like a really long frame in a slideshow? And you have to kind of pull a threshold out of your butt for that. Um, so next step uh, is to ex smooth extreme outliers. Like we get a lot of like weird corrupt things where like one frame will just have like negative one billion as a timestamp. So get rid of those. You can use really anything. Standard deviation is like the most basic thing you can use. Um, and before we go all and try and fudge a good frame rate, try and check if the file is a mix of known good frame rates. Like if you have. Uh, you know, film content, you know, drop 24 with a 60i uh, credits, you want to pick, you have to kind of make a, a it's a bad choice, but you got to pick like, am I okay with the credits being killed or are you okay with jerky, you know, jittered content throughout the rest of the file? Uh, so you, you kind of have to throw some heuristics at that, like if a certain percentage of the file is this and that, but you pick, you know, the, the frame rate out of this set of frame rates that you like, otherwise you, kind of have to fudge it uh, based on you know means and a couple other heuristics. Uh, this is my favorite topic, virtual timelines in Matroska and MP4, also known as edit lists. Um, for some reason, someone thought it would be great to apply it at a demuxer level, but it's supposed to be applied at a presentation level, and we have to adjust the rate during transcode, not demux. Uh, Adjust timestamp. You have to adjust timestamps based on these. Sometimes you'll have to repeat timestamps. Sometimes you'll have to repeat timestamps that won't get displayed because of H.264 uh, frame reordering or the other frame reordering. And you need to be aware of this. You need to prime the decoder or encoder or whatever you're doing. Uh, don't trust durations in containers, except when you can. Um, so you need some kind of sanity threshold because if you if you, if you, generally, if the duration, like the, you know, the overall duration of the file is less than the coded samples, someone has made a soft edit and they want you to cut those samples off. You want to respect that, but if the duration is something like, you know, 19 hours and you have five seconds of coded video, you, you don't want to encode 19 hours of black frames after that. Uh, and when in doubt, you just trust the coded durations. Uh, both streams have to be taken into account for padding. Uh, this is more of a browser thing because MSE requires that both streams end at the same time. And this is generally applied to partial uploads because they're really common. Some people upload with FTP still. It's great. And uh, make sure you take all the rates into account because there's like 
track rate, stream rate, like overall rate, that kind of thing. Uh, moving on to audio, you down mix. I covered this earlier. You want to use any kind of metadata that you have to down mix. Don't just kind of down mix to what you think the standard 5.1 to 2.0 mixing matrix is. Use it if it's there. Um, I didn't list it here, but uh, take DRC into account. Uh, you need to silence fill gaps, except when you don't need to silence fill gaps. Uh, again, this is heuristic. Um, for example, uh, WMV files have this great thing where it looks like you need to silence fill gaps, but you don't. Um, so you have to special case it again, uh, but they're actually meant to be repeated. And you have to handle approximate timestamps. That's some encoder's output. Uh, I'm sure you're all very familiar with kind of oscillating timestamps from dealing with like 90 kilohertz time bases and stuff like that. Uh, so if you're trying to be sample accurate and you have, you know, just you have a you have some AAC audio and it's it's saying like each sample is, you know, 1023 samples, then 1025, then 1023, then 1025, but you know LC AAC of this variant is supposed to be 1024 samples per frame. Uh, you need to adjust to that, smooth it out, and of course you need to resample to, you know, a reasonable sampling rate. You don't want to be encoding five hertz audio or something crazy. And this one is less obvious to some people, but you cannot take audio and video uh, timestamps alone. You have to take both streams into account, uh, especially when there's discontinuities because uh, in this example here with my great MS Paint skills, um, you have two MPEG TS files, they've been catenated, there's a discontinuity in the middle of it. The video for the first one ends early, er, and if you didn't know that the audio continued on and you were just looking at the video, you would just try and fill that discontinuity in and adjust the timestamps there and everything would go out of sync. So you do need to take into account all streams when trying to sync files. Uh, captions. Thankfully, I only have to output VTT right now, no 608. I do have to ingest 608, but as text. So uh, you need to know, because the, they're time codes in SEC files, you need to know the, the, the frame rate or field rate of the underlying video, which you don't necessarily have because users can upload whatever the hell they want. So you can just have to look at what the highest uh, frame in the time code you see is and say, I guess it's that or kind of pin it to some known file or some known rate. Uh, before I was hired, this is like 10 years ago, someone decided it would be a great idea to try and guess the user's uh, text encoding for all their subtitles. And uh, this is as bad as it sounds. Um, so we had so many bug reports for this because we were using you know, like ICU or get text or something to try and probe what the text encoding was because you know, product won't let me remove this feature. Uh, but it turns out if you just try and decode everything before you do anything, try and decode it as valid UTF-8, if it can decode as valid UTF-8, it's extremely unlikely to be anything else. Like, I have had zero reports in the last, like, three years that we've detected this wrong. But anything after that is still up to, mm, it's in the air. Um, of course, you have to sanitize any kind of attempt at cross-site scripting out of it, HTML, CSS, etc. This is pretty much what you think it is. It's like... 900 line regex, <laughs> and you gotta, you gotta accept all sorts of mangled timestamps, you know, maybe it has two zeros instead of three, that kind of thing. Again, it's 900 line regex. Um, you, have to, you have to check for, there's a weirdly common trend of people like pasting their subtitles into Word and trying to upload doc files, so <laughs> I found it was helpful to like give a little feedback to the user and say like, hey, this is a Word file. Not a subtitle file. Uh, there's more. Uh, this is kind of just like a mishmash of other random stuff is. Like, we also, we also have to, you know, ingest spherical video, equicangular video, 3D ambisonics, all that kind of stuff. I particularly like Apple's slow-mo video files that iPhones started to create maybe, I want to say it was four or five years ago. And they, instead of just using like a normal, normal like custom box or user data or something, they decided, nah, like, we're going to just say, in QuickTime, if it's created by this version of the iPhone and the frame rate is 60 over one, it's slow-mo. <laughs> this is extremely backwards compatible. Uh, then just like the endless amount of fun in uh, MP4, like 
I don't really want to get into edit list stuff. I kind of mentioned it earlier that they decided to implement uh, edit lists in the demuxer instead of at the presentation level, which means they're trying to ascribe to packets what should be in the time domain. And if you have like a packet that's longer than what should be dropped, it'll go to sync, fun stuff. Um, I would really like to meet the guy who decided to just like, instead of like putting the rotation is this, and then before he's like, no, nah, no, nah, we're, we're just gonna code like the affine matrix so we can like put it right in the file, just read it out of the file and shove it into a shader. Like, and now we, everybody's written like, people don't wanna write matrix code, so instead they just try and fudge it and like, oh, we'll read like the top left value and infer things from that. And, <laughs> and of course, MP4 could have multiple streams on at once. One of them could have alpha. You have to detect that, overlay it. Uh, midstream parameter changes. Everything is, there's no such thing as a stream-wide uh, value. It's per frame or per, or I guess it's audio frames as well, but so per frame only, that's it. You can change, everything can change in every frame. Uh, and of course, old fun bugs, again, from Apple. My favorite is, for some reason, old QuickTime can't handle QPs less than five in HG64. It's like the most arbitrary thing ever, but it's still there. Uh, links and questions. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, thank you, Derek. Uh, to detect interlaced content, are you using the FFmpeg filter, or do you have your own uh, implementation? And if there's an, if you have your own implementation, did you ever compare them? Uh, uh, we're using it's based off the FFmpeg filter. There's, okay. We there's we don't have any secret sauce there. You don't have no no secret sauce. Okay. It's VFI that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I always appreciate when people come from industry to scare the shit out of people who are archivists. Um, my question is, oh, like, how do you, you're getting all of this stuff, and it's so much content, but how do you identify that something is bad? Like, are users just complaining, or? Uh, so, unlike certain other video websites, our, our support is not, like, a black hole, and they actually forward stuff to us. Wow. And that's how we find a lot of this stuff. Um, and I have a quick follow-up question, too, which is, um, I'm assuming, too, I, I know there are people out there surely using Vimeo as their archive, you know? Um, when you are taking a file in, you're not keeping the original, right? So when someone downloads we the do, file back... We do back, keep the original if they oh, want. So if you, if you can download the file back, you're downloading yes. the original. Oh, interesting. Okay. There is an option to keep the original file. If we also have a new thing, you know, it'll create more of a standard mezzanine, AVC intra kind of thing. Wow. Great. With um, Born Digital Material, I came across like the era of audio video running out of sync whenever you kind of touched it file, whenever you try to transcode something that plays nicely, actually. But once you try to transcode, audio video falls apart. Right. Any answer why this is so popular? Um, <laughs> like these files do play, so why do yeah, they fall apart? Um, 99% of the time, it's because of like the, the ffmic.c cli uh, timestamp mungling code that was written like 15 years ago and needs an update. There's, it's just kind of like nobody wants to touch the poo. Um, any more questions? Repeat. <laughs> What's your favorite file format? Okay, so my favorite file format, it's not listed here. I mentioned it in my Demux talk last year. It's like a, it's like a pseudo file format, and rather than coding a video frame, this is in a mob file, so it's like QuickTime, old QuickTime would play this, no problem, is instead of uh, like coding a video frame like you would think, it encoded instructions on how to animate a fire and QuickTime would animate this fire for you. And there's like one file that exists, but QuickTime had this codec built in for like 10 years. 
If I want to upload a video and make your life easier, what would the suggestion be? Like, do you have a white paper of if you do this, then we don't have to hack? We have a very large set of guidelines that you can read on the site for all sorts of NLEs and everything. Just, uh, I'm a very uh, often a Vimeo user, you delete old, 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 old files. Uh, that's more of a, well, one, it's an, a thing that we did years ago that we hear complaints about to this day. <laughs> and the other thing is, it's, uh, this is more of a businessy thing. I don't like to do businessy things, but uh, like some people pay us to keep their files and stuff like that. Uh, or they, there's like a box they didn't check in, check in the past or something. But this is like not my, not my f part of the video. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much.